Hello and welcome back to this video and this is going to be a special one. So uh, from time to time as I did before I'm going to pick some subjects and I'm going to uh, bring those subjects from the lens of uh, uh, biases and how uh, different biases might uh, in combination affect that particular field and today I'm going to start what I hope is going to be a series within the series of biases in which I'm going to focus on uh, particular social networks and how that affects um, your behavior or the, affects the way that you perceive and see things. So I'm going to title these what Facebook do, might do to your brain. But again, in the future will be Instagram, might be uh, um, LinkedIn, it might be other social networks. But in this case, I'm going to focus exclusively today on uh, uh, Facebook. However, I'm not suggesting with this that uh, Facebook intentionally, obviously, uh, is pursuing these type of behaviors. And I'm not even suggesting that that behavior is replicated by every single person who consumes Facebook. But again, that's why the title is might do to your brain, because there's some logic behind uh, this type of behavior. So that might act actually affect uh, a lot of people. So these and uh, to have a starting point of view, um, I, I decided to start with the idea of communication and that idea on how we communicate with other people and how is that shaped by our environment. So until very recently, um, all the opinions that we formed was based on what we see, what we saw around us, basically our family's values, our, our groups, meaning the people that we go to school, the people that we interact um, out of school in practicing with sports, all of that shaped the way that we perceive. And that was the only influence that we had with the exception, uh, exception, excuse me, of one, which was um, the media. And in this case, the media was represented mainly by radio, TV, and uh, newspapers. So as you can see, it's kind of easier to see how a person might think if that person uh, grew up in a particular environment, right? So, as we discuss in the in-group bias and the group think, um, the people around you has an enormous uh, uh, influence in the way that you think. Still, till they say that is true, but now we're encountering a slight difference because of social media. So again, traditional we have these what we call checks and balances, both in media and in person. Um, because again, people around you would tell you what they thought, and sometimes you would encounter people who thought differently than you and would oppose to you, oppose you to, uh, to certain ideas. I know that it might seem kind of the opposite. It might seem kind of like, well, in the past, if you grew up in one particular environment, definitely everyone thought the same thing or the same way. And that might be true, but you definitely would encounter at some point someone who opposed certain ideas and uh, that person would talk to you directly. Now, as I said before, traditionally, People around you would share their opinions with you, even those different than yours. Your opinions then were shaped by your environment, as I said before, until very recently, just um, influenced by what was physically next to you. The people that you interact um, um, on the regular uh, basis and also the people that you interact when you went to, for example, a trip. But that was pretty much it. There was nothing much more than that. International friendships were not that common unless until fairly recently. And most people were not as aware of other cu cultures as they are today. All of what I'm saying is not bad at all. Like being exposed to other cultures, being exposed to other people and how they think, it's actually a good thing. So I always try to emphasize that duality. So the same thing can actually bring one positive side, which is, again, being interested by other cultures, being interested by what other people think uh, like or how the other people think like. Um, all of that is good. All, all of that can actually enrich your life. However, there's also a negative side. Once you start to form only certain friendships with the people that uh, think alike. Now, being exposed to posting uh, views from a different culture was rare. So you would, again, being exposed to opposing views within your own culture, but you wouldn't go necessarily to the other extreme of a different culture who's not only opposing views within your, what you consider normal in your culture, but exposing to 
opposite views that were not even conceivable in the people on, on your surroundings or the people who are in your surroundings or as part of your surroundings. Now, email actually started to change the way that we communicate. So if we can trace back that to that uh, catalyzer in which uh, everything started to change, yes, you can always pick uh, uh, a point in the past. You can actually um, accuse Gutenberg and uh, the, the reproduction of, uh, of books, in this case, as the catalyzer for many um, manipulations that done through books and media. That's true, but keep in mind that all of that was common and was kind of um, the same throughout centuries and centuries. And email actually changed it in a more rapid way. Why? Because it made it easier not only for you to communicate with all the people around you, the people that you knew, and that's part of what how we was used in the past. Uh, but it also made it easier to communicate with people that you wanted to communicate. And that is a distinction because if all of a sudden you go to a trip and then you meet someone who is from Japan and then you're interested in certain things and then you, you kind of feel intrigued by that and now you can form this friendship with uh, a Japanese person. Well, in the past, that would be not impossible because you could still write a letter, but it would take substantially more time. Um, and not a lot of people would be investing that amount of time. So now imagine how that only affects the way in which you communicate and the things that you can learn. So before, again, as I said before, you would have to um, write a letter, send it to a mail and expect for uh, wait for the other person to receive it wait for the other person uh, to respond if that person responded and send it back to you, wait for the mail. And, and if you receive it, just look at that. So as you can see, not a lot of opinions can be shaped just by um, using that methodology because it will take a long time. But nowadays it's easier for you. And after the creation of email, was easier for you to communicate uh, immediately. So that is actually the main uh, difference is that now you can see immediate response in that encourage people to communicate in a way that before was impossible because you have that um that capacity to respond and that capacity to have a real quote-unquote conversation with someone while in the past will require more time in between so now emailing made it easy to communicate with people we wanted to communicate with even those who were that were not physically uh, close to us now the consequences of that is because it's that if we had the choice and we can choose now between the people that are a lot kind of around us. And I mean, kind of because they're not 100% or they're, they don't have 100% the same type of interest as you do. And the choice of um, communicating with someone who is more alike than you are, but leave someplace else. Um, probably most people would choose to spend more time to the people who are alike. Remember what we have discussed um in these years, and this is a common thing that I have um, repeated myself uh, many times, um, that idea of knowing your surroundings and how important it is for you to get that, um, that level of familiarity, because all of these comes from our primitive brain needing to find some commonalities, understanding our surroundings. So if we don't understand something, especially when we don't understand something, when we feel um, that there are too many opinions that are contradictory or contradicting our own opinions. We don't feel safe. What do we do? Immediately, we try to, for, uh, to find um, familiarity, and that comes uh, in the shape of choosing people who are alike. So, yes, there's nothing more than a confirmation bias through people. I'm confirming my ideas by linking to people who think alike, who are like me. So, that produces a natural selection of people who are similar to you, meaning you no longer have to have to, in this case, you don't have to just choose the people who are in your vicinity. Now you have the choice. Again, so far, so good. So far in the sense that, yes, there's some uh, advantages. And there's, as I always say, there's a balance that we have to keep between having people alike and uh, being exposed to people who are different than us. There's some benefits, but as I always said it, as I at least said it in the past, being exposed to constantly to people who are opposite to you can also create some traumas. It's actually not good. So again, it's always good to have a balance. So naturally in the past, that balance was created by your own community. And uh, sometimes you were not only exposed naturally, but people actually would 
expose you to some ideas that were not initially the same as the ideas that you think. But now you have that power again uh, since email was created to communicate with people that were more alike. So now still our opinions were heavily influenced by the people we're physically interact with. What I mean is even with the creation of email, even to this day, we're still heavily influenced by the people uh, that we physically interacted with, as I explained on the um, group think and the in-group bias, especially your family or the concept of family that you might have um, has an enormous impact on the way that you not only behave, but the way that you think and the way that you see things. So email started to change that, but then forms created these enormous catalyzers. So again, yes, the uh, email started um, this shift, but I would argue the forms were the ones that actually catalyzed that, um, that behavior, because now not only you can talk to one person, it's not only a one-to-one -one ratio anymore, it's a like one too many. And the best thing is that you could see what other people were thinking. Again, this encouragement to share certain opinions that didn't exist before now is not only okay, it's out there. You can see it. You don't have to fear that. Maybe in the past when email didn't exist, expressing certain opinions in a crowd would actually be a little bit more um, nerve wracking. But now with the safety of being at home and not seeing and no one seeing your face, people felt more um, open and even encouraged to express their opinions. Now, when online forums appear, it was easier than ever to look for and to find people with similar interests, likes and opinions. So as I was saying before, the email allowed you to actually communicate with people one on one, especially through websites, you would might find certain things uh, that were of your interest. And I'm going to give you a particular example. I think I have said this example in the past. Let's say that because I always like this example. Growing up, for example, in my case, people were not um, exposed to manga as much. Keep in mind, I'm not, I'm, I'm not disliking or liking manga. I'm, I'm just not obsessed. I've watched some, but I'm not, uh, um, I'm not very captivated by it. Uh, now that there's no good manga, but again, I'm like, I don't really care in one way or the other way. However, I knew a couple of people who really liked manga and they couldn't actually, um, uh, express that because people in, in my time, at least when we were growing up, were looking down to the people who like manga. So obviously there was some bullying going on and then people would just make fun of them. So emailing, it would just allow a person who, for example, likes manga to communicate with someone else who likes manga. And maybe that is not a person who lives in the vicinity. As I said before, it's someone who lives in a different part of the country or in a different country. Now that is again, a communication one-to-one, -one, but if you now find an entire site where people are sharing ideas, all of the things that you thought inside and then never share with anybody else because you were afraid of being bullied because you didn't have the support around you because the people around you didn't even understand, or maybe because you thought they wouldn't understand all of a sudden you are exposed to that. And then that is an enormous reward. Remember that we're looking for our reward system are looking for constantly for things that can reward us um, in the way that we behave. So when we not only see familiarity, but when we see a sense of normalcy am among that, we feel better. We feel like, oh, we're not isolated anymore. We don't have to be isolated. That thing that I thought that it was bad or wrong. Now it turns out that a lot of people have the same interests. So that is okay. So I'm free to feel okay. So again, Keep in mind that everything that I have said so far sounds a positive, but keep also in mind that there's always a duality. As I said before, on one side, yes, you have the benefit of being able to communicate with people who are alike and people who think like you and express your own desires freely. But on the other hand is that because of that, you might actually start to communicate exclusively to other people who are alike and isolated yourself from the community that physically lives within uh, your confinings. Um, now, finding safety among others gave us a strong sense of security. Remember that um, this is from our um, uh, old brain, our primitive brain that is constantly looking for things that are familiar to us, things that can 
tell us that we are okay, that we understand our surroundings, that those ideas that we have in our minds are true. So obviously, this is a form, as I always say, of confirmation bias. Not necessarily the confirmation bias that you base uh, on reading something that confirms your preconceived ideas, but finding people that actually express similar ideas to yours. Now, Facebook now started. And if you see, again, the evolution, if we continue, is email, websites, forums, and now we have Facebook. So Facebook was, at least in the beginning, not necessarily a continuation of that model of forms, but it was very similar to it. However, Facebook allowed to share more than just your opinions. It's not only that you're going to type anything and that's it. And yes, keep in mind that uh, back then, some forms allowed to share certain uh, images. But in this case, most forms were just to share opinions, like written opinions. Uh, however, Facebook allowed you to now share um, pictures, which is interesting because it's not only a way for you to communicate, but people can actually see you. People can, can actually see what you're doing, can see your interests, can identify with what you're wearing, can identify with the type of brands that you use. Um, so again, we could sympathize more or much more, uh, with the group because in this case, we, we can actually see how a particular person is wearing something that, for example, I like to wear or something that is, um, or that I consider brave to, to wear, but I'm scared of wearing. So as you can see, we're sympathizing at a different level. It's not only about communication in terms of writing communications, how I perceive the other person. And that is a big change because again, now we're engaging the different portion of our brain. We're engaging the visual aspect as well. And now not only confirmation bias is a play in this position, but also in group bias and group think, which is something that I have kind of suggested um, uh, in the past. Why? Keep in mind that Facebook groups didn't actually, uh, was not created until fairly recently, meaning didn't exist in the beginning. However, you could link quickly with different people and you can message them or you can actually write on their uh, page and then you can communicate with them and with the people that they're friends with. So that would allow you to not only know people that you think you're alike, but also people that they are alike with, meaning people that maybe were with the same example into mangas. Now you communicate with someone who thinks similar to you. And then it turns out that that person has a group of friends, maybe friends that this person has at home that are very similar to your thinking, or they think the same way as you do. So as you can see now, it's not only the communication one-on-one, -on -one, it's not even the communication that you can see people talking about certain things, it's the possibility of you to discover new people through those people. So again, it's all about opening channels for communication with people that are alike. Keep in mind, again, as I said before, that duality that always exists, keep the positive. Yes, the positive, and maybe that's a reason why Zuckerberg and other people create these social networks is for you to communicate with people. The negative side is that we also are very dependent on our own brain and we're dependent on how our brain works. And unfortunately, our brain sometimes cannot distinguish between one and the other one. And it's very difficult, especially if you think about it from a, um, from a, um, addictive point of view or addiction point of view. So if you think about it from an addictive or an addiction, uh, point of view, obviously it's going to be very difficult to convince your brain that you're acting in a manner that is not good or it's not conducive to good things to you. So that's why, uh, that, idea of neuroscience is so important because theoretically we meaning the people who are in the neuroscience space should be looking for a way to um help people to understand how the brain works with the hopes that they can make good decisions for themselves and also to help them make good decisions for themselves um but unfortunately some of these knowledge has been used in a way to do the opposite, in a way for them to get more people into paying attention to those products, paying attention or remaining in those platforms. So that's when I started to divide the line into the good things and the bad things. Now, the next one is going to be algorithms. I'm going to discuss on why algorithms change the entire game. So now, 
before all of this, and again, if we started with the same conversation that I started uh, uh, from the beginning, if you remember, um, until very recently, our brain only evolved in a matter to understand very few things um, or very few opinions in our surroundings. So let's for, let's actually be devil's advocates and un- understand two different points of view, right? One is the argument of we do have the capacity to deal with many things at the same time. And then the other one is going to be the opinion of maybe our brain is limited in the capacity on understanding or being exposed to, to certain amount of information. So let's actually go for the positive. Let's actually look for, yes, we have an unlimited capacity to understand other points of view and we can just adjust. So if that was the case, then obviously uh, we can continue forever. We can continue um, you know, looking for new ways of doing certain things to interact with other people. That would be fine with the exception of our limited amount of time. So even if I follow that advice, even if I, uh, excuse me, I follow that, um, that path, even if I focus on our limited or uh, unlimited, if you will, capacity to um, understand uh, different points of view, let's say that human beings are capable of not being bothered by extreme opinions, they can continue acting like nothing. There's always a constraint about time. So in this case, our time is consumed by uh, consuming media, obviously, but also we need to work, we need to uh, make money, obviously, and we need to interact with people outside. Now, within these people, the people who um, think that we have an unlimited uh, capacity to understand other points of view and then interacting with people with opposing uh, views and will not have any effect on you, uh, there's a subset of people who think that when you interact with other people, it's okay if you do it online. It's the same argument. Some people actually, like me, my my case, I'm of the opinion that you cannot have the same amount of uh, interaction, the same richness within the interactions if you're missing certain important clues. Like, for example, having the one-on-one face-to-face and uh, um, physical uh, visual aspects and visual cues that give you a normal conversation between one person and another person. Second is because it's difficult to convey certain um, emotions uh, just by using a tone. Yes, there's an argument that what would happen to blind people who cannot see. Well, there's some adjustments that obviously are done if you not only grow up, but if you have that reality and then you have to adjust into um, understanding conversation differently and and picking up to certain clues to detect certain emotional cues. But let's say that in general, the main problem that we have, if we are of this argument, meaning the argument in which we can have an unlimited capacity to interact with people, even with opposing views and have no uh, relevance, we always have the constraint of time. The algorithms actually are designed to give you more of what you want. So even if you're of that positive belief, there is also um, a consequence of, of that algorithm, the consequence of spending more time uh, consuming the same type of uh, content, meaning you are in a platform reading, watching, but you're not interacting with other people, meaning obviously you're spending the same amount of time. So even if you are of that opinion, there's always something negative. But things get worse if you are of the other opinion. In my case, I'm going to be open. I'm of that opinion. There's a limited capacity that we have. And that doesn't mean that it's limited, period. Obviously, we can adjust. However, it might take longer than we think. Maybe it will take a century. We don't know. Maybe it will take a century. Even think about how uh, the uh, um, uh, how just the printing press change the entire course of history and how the revolutions that subsidized uh, that, that uh, were subsequent to that, the, the revolutions, the way that people behave, the change in politics, all of those changes shape within centuries after that. And it's just because something changed from having the monopoly of uh, knowledge to having an easy access to knowledge. So that is nothing in comparison to what we have today, because now we not only have access to every single thing that we want, we want to learn anything, 
we we can have access to that, which is again more revolutionary than that um, the, that example that I was just giving you. We also have access to different people with different opinions, with different intentions. So it's easier for, for us to be manipulated as well, which we will deal in a second. So again, there's also a limitation on the capacity that I have to deal with different opinions and um, to certain negative uh, uh, negativity within the media itself. What I mean by that is, in the past, we were used to it during our whole evolution. If you take our evolution and you take just the last 20 years in which we have been exposed to social media, uh, if you take our whole evolution, we have evolved in a way that we were exposed to certain things, but we can also retreat and get into safety, meaning we could go home, we could just sit down and just think about our own things, forget about certain problems that we had in a class when we were growing up or with someone at work uh, that was arguing with us. Today, we, say, we see the same type of arguments over and over and over again, and we also might be targeted uh, by those same arguments. So the question is, what is our capacity to deal with those problems? Do we have the capacity to deal with those at the same rate or we just have a limited capacity and then that's it? Maybe one of the consequences that we are facing right now is because we don't understand that we have that limited capacity and then we're trying to power through that because in one way it feels well, it, feel, it feels good, excuse me, to have enormous advantages of, of uh, knowing people literally from everywhere and having a hint of how they think. But on the other hand, we can be easily manipulated. So again, you have to always think about it from that duality. Now, what does algorithms have to do with any of what I was just saying? Well, the more I consume, the more I get what I want. That's one of the things that the algorithms not only are good for, uh, or they're good at, they're just literally designed for that. So not only do I get a strong sense of security, of what I see, remember that confirmation bias that makes us feel well and uh, good, excuse me. But thanks to the algorithms, my idea of the world is skewed. If I'm only exposed to the same things over and over again, and on the other hand, I have this enormous exposure to criticism that exists today through social media. What am I going to do? Immediately, I'm going to shut down the same way that we were doing in the past, the same way that we have always done. Um, once we're confronted with something uh, that might make us feel unsafe, we go into safety. And that is represented by looking for something that is familiar to us. In this case, thanks to the algorithms, we we have a way out. We don't have to spend any more time dealing with anybody. We don't have to hear any negative comment. We can just look for that. And, it, and in fact, the more negativity I see on the outside, the more I'm going to try to look for that. So this is actually one thing that surprises me about this conversation that sometimes people are, uh, in fact, bothered by certain controls that social media now are trying to implement for health benefits. And then they're saying, well, this is an attack on freedom of speech. Guess what? People are not choosing freedom of speech. They're choosing to look for their own tribes because that's a natural way for us to deal with the problem in the first place. Every time we see someone that makes us feel unsafe, we retreat. That is something that we cannot get rid of because it's actually something that has protected us literally since the beginning of our species. And also to other species. It's not only common from our own species, it's common with other species. So the second thing, and because we're exposed to things that only confirm our points of view is why wouldn't I think that I'm right if all I see proves my points? Like, why would I think that I'm not right? Why would I think that is there anything different if all I see is confirming my points of view? So imagine that already extreme situation. I see a lot of negativity in the world. Now I have a strong sense of urgency to look for safety. I look for people uh, online and I find all these people that have been pre-selected for me that think the same way. So why would I think now that if 99% of the things that I see are siding with me, that there's anything uh, that is correct with the other point of view? In fact, I would think, well, the other point of view is wrong because there's only 1% of the things that I see that are contradicting of what I think. So 
that idea of why would I think I'm right if all I see uh, proofs of my point or I only see people who have similar opinions is the negative side of algorithms. Now, this factor alone makes it extremely hard for a person to change a point of view. Not only I don't have to question anything, uh, but the information also, um, the information also I get only suggests that I'm right. So again, it's not that I'm selecting anymore. The algorithms is doing the selection for me. So I don't need to do that anymore. I don't need to do anything. In fact, that is selected for me. So because of this, and um, as I was introducing that idea of manipulation and how it's easier now to be manipulated, I wanted to dedicate a portion of that, what I mean by manipulation. Now, Obviously, we have heard of these um, in different cases. The most, I think, popular is going to be the Cambridge Analytica, but it's not the only one in which um, Cambridge Analytica, if you don't know, is a company or was a company in, uh, in the UK that uh, uh, basically purchased a lot of the data that Facebook uh, was gathering and used that data to shape elections, sh shape the opinion. So basically... Uh, politicians or um, marketers that work for politicians would hire them and then they will establish a uh, strategy to um, target certain people to shape certain opinions and that feedback was would then be sent back to the politicians or the uh, people in charge of their communication to communicate more effectively and efficiently in sync with those opinions that were being seen online. Now, this is when your opinions can lead to people controlling you. So again, you can express yourself. That's great. And when you see that idea being um, expressed through other people, you might think, well, I'm not the only person. You've received that confirmation from someone else. You, you think that you are right. Uh, again, there's the positive side. You, you feel like you understand, again, your surroundings. If you think from the primitive uh, brain that we were discussing before, but that also has a, a, another side, a negative side. The side is like, all right, so now that I know how you think, I can use that against you. So if I know that you're, um, that there's a button that can actually um, uh, make you react in a way, it could be in a positive way or a negative way, especially in negative ways, I, I can use it. I can use it against you. How? I can actually make you um, think that what you're fearing the most is happening at a rate that maybe it's not happening, but I can make you feel that it's happening very often, very often by um, creating a group that exposes exactly that or worse by creating a group that expresses that opinion that you're so fearing. So if that's the case, obviously you are exposing yourself to being manipulated and Cambridge Analytica is an example, an extreme example of, of that, but it's not a unique one. Um, people can use information and opinions you publish against you. Again, it's, it's not only that the algorithms are learning necessarily about you. They're learning about you. They're learning about the people who are like you, the people that you're interacting with, and they're establishing the patterns. They're there to design exactly that. That's literally their job. The job of the algorithms is to design um, uh, a pattern that can link you with people who are like you, hopefully to create uh, uh, some harmony. But as a negative side, obviously, is that they can use that to show to other people that have a different intention. And in fact, uh, there's an author called Renee Durest Duresta. She has talked about these um, events and all their events are very similar. And she has talked about her experience investigating these type of groups, the groups that I was describing before. She gave amazing um and has given amazing uh, uh, information about how these groups uh, react. Like, for example, um, let's say that uh, a, a group, uh, for example, in Russia was uh, creating groups of Facebook groups uh, that were at the same time um, pro -black, black Lives Matter and, and pro white supremacy. And then uh, they were basically creating content to feed off each other. So obviously, the people who um, saw that and were in one side um, obviously would join that side, but also would be scared of the other side. So as you can see, is an example of how you can be easily manipulated again through your primitive brain. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying that as an insult, I'm just saying we all have that primitive brain. It's a natural thing to happen. So as I always try to do, I try to give you the uh, explanation from a neuroscience point of view so you can understand. In this case, I'm going to uh, 
it's not going to be like any other of the videos in which I, I could be a little bit more technical. So I'm going to keep it low tech. But keep in mind that idea of the uh, primitive brain that we are uh, discussing before, we all have it. And in fact, we're highly dominated by that. In fact, our first reactions, our emotions are definitely uh, part of the limbic system, which again, not very technical, but um, you need to know that that is the name, uh, is controlling the way that also you're going to behave because that can be the catalyzer, that can be the starting point for your actions. So again, Renee Duresta talked about her experience investigating this group that are trying to manipulate and swing people's opinions. So I would definitely recommend you to check her out. Um, there are plenty of interviews that she has conceded. And in fact, I wanted to name something. One of the things uh, to what degree she actually um, touched a nerve. I remember hit a nerve. I remember that after her... Um, interview with Joe Rogan, the Joe Rogan uh, podcast, you could see all the negative comments that uh, she was receiving um, in that uh, in, in that form. So basically, either she was striking a nerve because she was actually um, being right and then people were bothered by it, or some might say, well, the argument is that she was not wrong, that she's a scam or whatever. But in this case, all the things that she was saying are things that she has investigated herself. So you can imagine that if that was true, people who were, uh, that she was talking about will be interested in demolishing her uh, point of view because that will be exposing what they're doing. So anyway, I would definitely recommend. One other thing that is not related to that, but now related to that conversation that's recently... Um, on the Joe Rogan podcast, uh, someone was talking, his name was Tristan Harris, which I also definitely recommend you to check out. Uh, he was uh, talking about how um, now there are groups of farms. And if you don't know what a farm is, it's basically a group of computers that are interacting basically uh, with people and with each other was creating this enormous chain of text back and forth and all of them were AI, meaning there was no person involved and he was criticizing each other. Now, why would anybody be interested in creating that? Because if you want someone who is already polarized or you want to polarize someone even further, what you do is you create a fight, especially a fight in which that hits a nerve of someone else. And if let's talk about, uh, for example, any politicians, um, main points like abortion or your uh, take on gun control, for example, here, if you have bots commenting, but you don't know that they're bots, you think that they're real people commenting in coherent, quote unquote, coherent ways. And one side is saying outrageous thing. And the other side is saying outrageous things on the opposite side. Any people of any side would take, uh, uh, the, will take a stance and will chime in. And that will begin a bait. It's just like something for you to pay attention and something for you to fall for and something for you to consume, to be more outraged and to create even a further device uh, between one side and the other side. Now, how we start a conversation matters. And since we started with that idea of conversations and communication, I wanted to finish kind of, well, it's not the end, but before we finish with the solutions as I always do, I wanted to finish, uh, circle back to that idea of how uh, conversations um, are taking place nowadays and how we can start conversation and how we start conversation really matters. Now, if we are conditioned, manipulated, and most of the time angry, uh, unfortunately, this is one of the most of the uh, uh, status of a lot of people or a lot of Facebook users. Um, definitely, it's not going to be a good point to start a conversation because you're already going to be starting a fight directly. You're going to fight. You're not going to have a conversation. Now, condition, why? Because of the filters, and I'm not talking about like the physical filters, uh, the platforms uses, like the algorithms already are, um, are filtering information for you, right? to show you a skewed and biased version of reality. Remember that idea that you are shown certain things and then you fall for them, um, but you're not seeing the whole picture. That means that you are looking for things that are um, um, similar to your 
thoughts and similar to the way that you think, the way that you behave, um, that is the basis for confirmation bias. And then obviously you're conditioned now, now manipulated because there are people actively trying to take advantage of those opinions, trying to actively take advantage of how you think, how you see things, um, how you say things, how you interact with other people. What are your buttons? Um, actively again, trying to take advantage of the data also that you have published your opinions, interests to sell you products or ideologies. And mostly angry because our brain evolved to avoid threats and it's more focused on negative emotions. I'm going to actually divide that into two parts. As I was saying before, mostly angry because our brain evolved to avoid threats. Remember, our primitive brain is looking for safety. That is something that serves us well. It has served us our entire is basically how we have survived. Um, so what do we do when we feel threatened? We look for safety. Sometimes that, well, in the past, it used to be represented by being next to our family, looking for uh, 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 a good shelter, feeling safe in the compounds of that uh, shelter. Now, this is not only about that. It's also about looking for numbers, numbers of people who believe the same way that uh, we do. So when we're exposed to an idea, we can look for that safety within our people and to fight back. So again, this is also what is the basics for confirmation bias, but it gets further than just confirmation bias. It's not only to make you feel well, it's to protect you. So again, it's not only necessarily a bad thing, it, it comes from a good place, a good place of trying to protect yourself. So again, mostly angry because our brain has evolved to avoid threats, but the second part has to do with it's more focused on negative emotions. I think I discussed this the first video that I did, first and second, definitely. Because I remember that that was the basics on my argument for confirmation bias, that we're more focused on negative emotions. Now, why? Because obviously the things that are good are good for us, but it doesn't kill us, right? So knowing the things that are good is just giving us um, something good. But unfortunately, we're more hardwired to look for things that can potentially kill us. And that primitive way uh, brain, excuse me, have evolved in a different way now that we don't have physical threats like being chased by a lion or by another tribe. But now the chasing of our other li uh, of a lion or chasing by a, uh, a group is chasing by a group that can potentially harm the way that we think, uh, interrupt the well-being uh, of our life or interrupt the well-being of a, our family's uh, lives. So in this case, what we do, what we tend to do is look, again, for numbers in which can potentially do, uh, uh, try to uh, combat that feeling of being attacked. But it also has a downside, which is, again, I'm constantly, uh, constantly uh, being looking for negative emotions, things that can represent a, uh, a, a, a potential, if not uh, death, a substantial loss of quality of life. So since we're brain wired to detect more, we're also more brain wired to attack those, to actually oppose those ideas because we don't want them nearby. We don't want that to get back to us. We want to protect us from those. So what do we do? We look for people uh, that think like us and we try to combat by doing our best, by expressing our own opinions, by joining groups that can push back, if you will. Obviously, that has nothing to do with the truth. Remember, this is just our brain, our primitive brain trying to fight back. That's it. Now, since we're more focused on negative emotions, we're also more focused on sharing those uh, because it can protect other people. That is a consequence. That's one of the reasons why rating systems like five stars or uh, liking or whatever are not only fair, are not even, are not even good. And I know that nowadays when people are debating this thing about like the thumbs up and thumbs down with the uh, uh, YouTube, people are saying, well, I want to hear from my uh, people. I want to hear if one thing is worth listening to, or I want to hear from other people to save my time or whatever. There's a good argument to make then. It's like you, you need guidance from other people. However, keep in mind that first, you don't know these people. That's it. So the opinion of the people who are expressing those opinions, meaning those people's opinions are coming from people that you don't know, that you have no context whatsoever. Second, you don't know the intention of that. Maybe that person was 
angry at something else and is now being biased and commenting negatively about something else. Um, and third, as I expressed before, you don't even know if those people are real. What if all those negative uh, comments are being bought by someone else? What is the benefit? You don't have information that is, um, that is reliable. So I understand the, actually the argument in the opposite way, because in this case, I already made a case on why this is not good, because you don't know that person. And even if you don't uh, uh, know the person, you don't know if that person is angry at something else, it's expressing their biases or his biases or her biases um, with a different opinion that has nothing to do with the video or the service that you're looking uh, for right now. And third, that maybe someone has paid a company that creates those messages and none of them are real. So again, in one case, you have incredible manipulation. On the other side, you have the side of the person who was, who is creating that or the person who is uh, in charge of that service that has to suffer the consequences of these extremely skewed and negative um, system. So how is this person going to fight against that? Obviously, if the person doesn't have enough resources, if the person is just a, a hardworking person uh, who is trying to make it through and then all of a sudden has this negativity because someone else is interested in that person not to be there, um, then there's no competition. So obviously, it's not a good argument. It's not a good thing for you to have a system that is so skewed in the first place. Anyway, now, possible solutions, as I always say at the end, I like to give possible solutions to these. First, do not accept indirect sources. And this is something, again, when I say possible solutions, you can take them. You, you don't have to. Obviously, this is just a suggestion. If you don't want to do it, that's fine. The whole idea is for you to not know now that you know all of the things that I've explained, um, possible solutions for that. First, don't accept indirect sources go directly to the experts. Now, remember that in the first uh, video, in the second video, I think uh, in, um, in confirmation bias, I briefly touch on that idea of what an expert is. And uh, for example, to give you an example, uh, um, that we are kind of facing uh, these days with the uh, uh, COVID and vaccine, there are plenty of quote unquote experts that are actually not experts, but just because you're a doctor, you're not an expert. In fact, only few people can be experts in that particular field. So I would say definitely, definitely don't listen to just people who think they are qualified. But that idea of expertise depends because some people believe, oh, my chiropractor told me that, you know, I should not uh, do A, B, and C because in his experience. Well, a chiropractor is definitely not an expert in, um, in COVID. So... <laughs> I think that some people have a certain standard to what an expert uh, is. I think that an expert is the person who is in charge of one very narrow particular field. So in this case, with the COVID, for example, a virologist will be an expert. Uh, maybe a biologist in study, uh, studying uh, viruses also would be considered an expert. Definitely an infectious disease um, specialist is an expert, but not a traumatologist, for example. Uh, even if both are doctors. Uh, now, again, go directly to the experts. In case of not having an expert, take the information you read as opinion pieces. I think that you're going to be better off if you take it aside. Just literally just go with the mindset. You know what? I'm reading all these things. It's like the majority of information that I'm receiving, it just tells me the same thing. But none of the things that I've read are coming directly from an expert in that field in particular. So I'm going to take them as what they are, which are literally by default, just opinion pieces. They are not experts. And what is the difference is that those opinions can be changed. The people who have opinions can change, can not only be changed, meaning the opinions, but they can change their own opinions themselves. Think about the possibility of not having the right tools to understand the information or to be able to see the full picture. That is also another thing that I think I mentioned on the confirmation bias video in which I was actually saying, well, the problem with the confirmation bias is that you're constantly bombarded by people, people who think like you, people who act like you, and that feels well, That's that feels really good, right? But if, if you wait and then think about the, uh, the idea behind that, you might actually not even have the tools necessary to understand. Like for example, 
I remember this uh, YouTuber, I'm not going to say the name, but uh, was trying to explain, and this is a doctor, trying to explain certain benefits of the, um, of the vaccines. So he was explaining it in such a way that it was extremely difficult for anybody to understand. And I know for a fact, because then it turns out that I had the same conversation with someone else who was actually well-read. And not only well-read, this is a person who is in science, meaning he's a doctor. Um, not a doctor, a medical doctor, but he's a doctor in biology. He was actually saying certain things, and then he was confirming that he himself did not understand what this person was saying. So imagine a doctor in biology not understanding what this person was trying to say about the vaccines. And uh, those are people who are supposed to understand that. So if a doctor in biology cannot actually uh, understand that, if you're not an expert in such thing and you think that you understand, you probably are wrong. You probably are not. You think that you understand and that is a fallacy. You think that since the person is explaining it to you, you that you can actually understand it or you can understand the full picture. When in reality, there are probably many missing pieces. Don't get me wrong. There's on the other side, plenty of people who have done a great job at it, simplifying certain concepts that were complicated and complex and have made it. Uh, have made a good job at explaining those to other people. And then other people had said, yeah, I understand at least to this level. But keep in mind that, you know, there's a possibility that even if you have the feeling of understanding or having understood an information that maybe you did not fully understand because you don't have the necessary tools to understand those. Now, don't accept opinions of non-experts as facts. That's a consequence of what, what I was saying before or equating those opinions to the ones of the experts. Do never put the same length and weight, excuse me, uh, to those opinions. So an expert is an expert. It has, and again, that has nothing to do with, um, with um, being true. Like sometimes experts make mistakes and sometimes people who are not experts are right. And sometimes it's in the same, um, in the same, uh, about, about the same subject. Sometimes, it turns out that the people who were not experts were right all along. And then all of the people who were talking about certain things from the expert side were actually wrong. That can happen. That is a possibility. But until that is resolved, do not put them in the same category because they are not. And they're actually not equally, um, um, equally valid. Well, opinions are equally valid because they're opinions. However, when an expert gives you an opinion, comes from a selection of information from a point of view of expertise, from a point of view of having understood certain things that the other person might have not understood. However, as I said before, I want to clarify that that doesn't mean that the person, the expert is always going to be right and the uh, non-expert is always going to be wrong. There are chances in which an expert actually might be wrong and non-expert might be right. But again, think about it from a probabilistic point of view. The probability of a person to a uh, non-expert being right while an expert in that field being wrong, are very, 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 very small. So unless that is something that is clear, something that can be um, known really quickly, something that someone can give you a, a right answer right away, you should go with the thing that is the most uh, probable. So again, uh, don't try or don't try not to put in the same category the opinions of an expert of non-experts. Again, regardless of the many people I see as having the same opinion, and this is why, why Facebook and other social media actually can play a negative role in the way in which we, sh in which we shape our uh, behavior is because now experts who have a different opinion than me, let's say that you have a different opinion uh, in vaccines with an expert, then you're probably going to be bombarded with that information that confirms your preconceived ideas, which means that 90% of the things that you're seeing are contradicting the expert. The tendency to do, uh, uh, to, 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 to magnify what I'm seeing and, uh, minimizing the, uh, the, the opposing point of view of the expert is now, um, is now being enhanced by that number of people that have been pre-selected and shown to me that confirms my idea. So it's not only that I'm I'm going to pre-confirm my idea by just being more certain on what I believe and I'm going to discard the uh, example, the, uh, the opinions of the experts. It's also that now more people are thinking like me than what I see people thinking like the other expert. So again, 
try to always keep in mind that you are always receiving what you want to hear, not what it is true. Lastly, tweak the algorithms. Literally, choose to follow people, view information that is opposite of yours on purpose. Meaning, are you against vaccines? All right, so just start looking for things that are exclusively positive toward vaccines. Only information that is good about vaccines, only people who are experts in that. Try to switch and see if you can sustain the same opinion that you do. If you don't challenge your own opinion constantly, it's going to be easier for you to continue thinking the same way, even if, and especially if you are wrong. So as usual, I think um, this is a lot of information. So hopefully this is useful to you. Uh, thank you so much for watching this video. As I always try to say, this is only for you to keep that information for you. If you want to share this with other people, that would be great. But don't try to force anybody into having the same opinions. This is only for you to, uh, for tools, uh, it's a tool for self-reflection more than a tool to try to convince other people. So again, thank you so much for watching this video and I'll see you in the next one. Thank you.